In this video today, I'm going to build a small DIY NAS that tries to combine the benefits of a pre-built NAS's small size and low idle power consumption with the flexibility to choose parts and kind of configure a system how you'd want, like you would in a more traditional tower desktop system. I'm going to go through the process of how I pick the parts and build them all together, and I'm trying to go mostly focus on what parts I choose and why I picked them, and then go through some quick software setup later on in this video. I also want to mention that this video is sponsored by Miniswarm to take a look at this BD795SC motherboard. This is kind of a cool, unique ITX motherboard that can make a lot of sense for these systems, but also talk about other options as well later on in this video. And while this is a sponsored video, I want to note that all the numbers and thoughts I have are those of my own. Since I'm trying to emulate what a pre-built NAS can do in terms of form factor and power consumption, I first wanted to start off with a small NAS case that allows me to fit a lot of drives in and still give me reasonable options when it comes to things like power supplies, motherboards, and expansion. And I've been actually pretty happy with this John's Boat in one case I got a bit ago. Not only is it pretty compact, it fits a standard ITX and SFX power supply, and it's relatively easy to build in and work in without too many annoying compromises. There's many other options that have now come out on the market that try to fill this gap of being able to do DIY, but still have ITX and other expansion. And I think this is kind of a cool, unique case. I think it looks kind of nice, especially in the white model here. And I'm overall pretty happy working with it. The next thing that I'm going to pick, which is kind of a less exciting part, is power supply. One thing I wanted with the power supply is a white one, so it matches the rest of the system here and doesn't stand out as much. And I went with, with this Lian Li SP500 power supply. While 850 watts is way more power than an ITX system in here would likely ever need, modern power supplies are pretty good at idling at low power consumption. So we'll see in a little bit, but I'm guessing idle power consumption from this wall in the system should still be pretty good, even with a power supply that's capable of outputting quite a bit of load if it needs it. The next thing that I think about when building one of these systems is storage. So the way that this case is set up is I have five SATA hard drive bays built for three and a half inch hard drives. I then have one spot on the side that's designed for two and a half inch drives at the top of this system here. And I also have space on the motherboard for putting the internal M.2 drives as well as PCIe drives. When it comes to filling up all the drive bays, I could do something like a mixed array setup or add more drives later on or have mixed drive sizes, but I think it makes a RAID configuration a lot easier to just have one size of drive for every bay. And I've chosen here to go with a pile of three tier drives that I got used a while ago. I have found these kind of used refurb server pole drives to often be pretty good values in terms of dollars per terabyte and quite reliable in my experience. Now, I'd likely get more than three terabytes if I was buying a new drive today, but the biggest disadvantage is they're kind of noisy and power hungry compared to the lower, newer drives. But overall, I've been quite happy with buying these more budget used like Hitachi or HDST drives and not really had many issues. And I'd almost always buy these sorts of drives over something like a new NAS rated drive for my personal use, because I don't mind getting a slightly lower potential reliability, which hasn't been a major issue in my personal experience, for a good amount of cost savings on drives when buying them. So now we got drives set up. I've also, to save time in this video, done most of the wiring beforehand. And this is one disadvantage of these DIY NASs compared to the pre-built systems because you can't get custom cable lengths to go exactly where you need, or you can, but it's a lot easier to use the pre-included cables. Cables often a lot longer than they actually have to be, and there's the spot in here where all the extra cables get stuffed into, and the top looks a bit ugly. And I think this gets us here to the actual board itself, the Minis Form BD795SE. And when it comes to building a NAS system, there's a lot of board options that fit into ITX now. But unfortunately, because ITX is smaller, you can't get everything features-wise just because there isn't a ton of board space to do that with. But this mini form board is kind of an interesting list of features, starting off with actually probably the most interesting part, the CPU. It's an AMD Ryzen 7945HX, which is actually a mobile CPU. And for some fun, I took off the heatsink and got these die shots on it, which is actually exactly the same die and IO chipset as the 7950X on the desktop, but with slightly different power and CPU speeds and no chipset. 
No chips that unfortunately means no SATA ports on this board, but with dual M.2 slots, I can actually use one of these little M.2 to SATA converters, which is kind of neat and actually gives me enough SATA ports to run all these drives and one other SATA drive in this system and another SATA drive. So in addition to that, I get a decent amount of IO on the back, including 2.5 gig ethernet and a couple of USB 3 ports for some faster IO. And I'm hoping this means this will turn itself into a processor that uses essentially almost current gen Ryzen tech for high efficiency and high speed, relatively low power consumption at idle. The other thing I hope that this motherboard would do well in this case is since it has a slightly different heatsink design than most other motherboards that are designed for any AM5 heatsink, for example, it can actually just vent the heat out the back using this heatsink, which hopefully will help it run cooler. And the other theory I have is because it's not like an AM5 CPU with a heat spreader on it and is, and is instead direct dive cooling, hopefully that means more heat will be transferred to the heatsink, meaning this relatively small CPU heatsink can cool relatively well in this small, not very ventilated case. One more kind of oddity on this case is that it uses SODIMM DDR5 memory instead of the full size sticks on the desktop. For my use here, I have dual 32 gig SODIMs, which work just fine, but it might slightly limit you when it comes to using either the fastest or highest density modules, but generally SODIMs aren't that bad these days. And while this board doesn't have everything feature-wise, I think it's low power consumption and what should be a very high performance 16 core processor, it's going to be an interesting combination for kind of a NAS slash home server combo unit. I've played with other ITX boards in the past, like here's a Xeon D example I've gotten in the past. The problem is these older Xeons aren't that good in terms of performance, and power consumption wise, this system uses about 10 watts from the wall shut down, just because of its IPMI chips and other chips that just run all the time. So I'm hoping this will be an interesting compromise for a home server like this that offers enough IO and a less than fully traditional CPU choice. While the while the soldered on CPU limits your options if you wanted to change the CPU later on without changing the board, the CPU is still pretty good. Now that I got the motherboard in the system, let's talk a little bit more about storage and how all of that's going to work in the top part of the system. So this motherboard has essentially three slots that can be used for storage. Two M.2 slots and one PCIe slot. For the two M.2 slots, one of which is used by a SATA card, which is going to give me all the hard drive bays connection on this box. And the other M.2 slot is going to be used by a 2 terabyte SSD. My thoughts is Proxmox is going to allow me to take good advantage of this processor's extra compute power and these uh, all this memory I put in the system. But because I don't have a ton of slots, I was thinking it's probably best to have a single boot SSD as well as storage drive. This leaves me with a two and a half inch SATA drive, which I was thinking I'm gonna put this drive in, an Intel S3700 I got a while ago. These are pretty old drives now, but they're essentially SATA SSDs with about as close to unlimited write endurance as you can get. I think it's rated for close to 10 write cycles per day, which means using it for something like a log drive, especially since it has cache on it, would be kind of nice. And yeah, redundancy is nice for a log drive, it's still probably fine to have just one log drive in most circumstances, especially for home server use. Could also use it as a different cache drive or a VM drive, but this is a little bit small for a VM drive being only 200 gigs. I also just want to find a good home for this SSD. I feel like I have a very write heavy SSD that's capable of it and it gets very rarely used for applications that actually need a ton of writes these days. And that leaves us with essentially the PCIe slot. So. I like PCIe slots on these systems because they add a ton of flexibility. I could put like a 10 gig NIC in or something if I want faster IO. I could even put a card like this one in here on this system that has four M.2 bays as it actually does support PCIe bifurcation in the BIOS, which is, which is kind of a cool feature to see on a smaller board if I want a lot of IO bandwidth. Or I could put in like an Optane drive or something weird is a GPU like this. This is an NVIDIA RTX A400 which is a essentially low-end pro-grade card with pretty decent encoding capabilities. Um, now that all the hardware that I want for this initial testing is installed, I'm gonna go slot on the top cover for this case, and we're gonna start playing around with Proxmox on here. Um, at initial guy, I think all the major hypervisors should work fine on this hardware. 
I just am most used to Proxmox and just kind of want to see what the performance and power consumption numbers I get out of this box are. Now that I got this system all the way back together, I started playing around with the CPU, its performance, power consumption, thermals, and more. So let's get into that now. Overall, the Proxmox install process on the system was pretty painless. Just like any other system I've used, no weird oddities or anything, and I'm running Proxmox 8.4.1 on it, and everything worked out of the box. The next thing I was curious about, and very hopeful with this system, is power consumption. So I was thinking, no chipset, mobile CPU, ultra low power consumption? Let's see. So first thing I did is test it without drives and with drives. These mechanical hard drives are by far the most power hungry part of the system at idle. So this system with Proxmox installed and the web page being accessed pulls about 19 watts from the wall. With my hard drives plugged in, so that's five, three terabyte, I think 7200 RPM drives, that goes up to about 60 watts from the wall. Now, here's where I started noticing a bit of an oddity, I'd say, or kind of a quirk of a lot of modern CPUs, which is when you start to do tasks on them, for example, like running a VM, that VM has a few background tasks, and the CPU goes like, I'm going to go do this task as fast as possible, ramps clock speed up to this CPU's maximum of a hair over 5.4 gigahertz, does them quickly to its own respect, but also pulls a good amount of power doing so. So this means that when the system is fully idle, when the system is idle with those hard drives in it, it's pulling about 60 watts from the wall. With a Windows VM running at its desktop, it goes to about 130. I've seen this on other CPUs where the CPU power consumption really spikes from a true barely idle running nothing to just running a really light load. Now, when I got into the BIOS on this system and played with it, it doesn't have the most controls when it comes to this. It has all the basics, so for example, setting things, or I think by default allows you to do things like PCI pass-through without issues, um, some basic things like TPM, network booting, and all the basic settings, but it doesn't have a ton of controls like a gaming board would when it comes to overclocking. It has all the standard AMD PBO settings when it comes to setting up basic overdrive, but not as much granular frequency settings as I'd like to see. And this is when I dove into little Linux utilities to see if I can get it to work better. The first thing I tried was using the power save thing. Maybe that's going to make it run a little bit more conservative clock speed wise with no significant difference. After trying that, what I decided to try next was just dropping the max clock speed. I've seen this on previous CPUs before. We're going from their peak clock speed, which is generally very inefficient compared to a little bit lower, which can be much more efficient, really reduces the amount of power consumption. And in this case, running that one VM went from 130 watts with a single Windows VM running and doing its background stuff that Windows loves to do to about 80 watts on the wall, which isn't that much more than 60 watts or its true idle power consumption. And just for fun, let's try full load power consumption and see how that differs now. So with this system with mechanical hard drives in it and all the CPUs being pinned with stress in Linux, it's pulling at about 4.4 gigahertz on all cores, pulling about 175 watts from the wall. And if I go run my little script that drops it down to 4 gigahertz, the system drops down to about 145 watts, which is a decent amount of power savings, especially at lower loads in my experience, for what is not that big of it. So you're definitely taking a performance hit at the highest things. So while I've seen this behavior on a lot of other boards, it's something worth thinking about if power saving is your biggest goal. But let's talk about where the system excels pretty well as well, which is performance. I tried running Cinebench on this system, in a Windows VM, and it did about 1500 on 2024 multi-core and about 105 single core, which is pretty good for a modern CPU. Very good considering the fact that it's running in a VM with its performance hit, and there's also no real performance tweaking. I've also run the very basic ZSTD-B benchmark and running it right now, I can see, compare it to your system if you happen to have easy access to one, but about 380 megabytes per second compression and 2600 decompression in single threaded ZSTD. This is definitely a pretty impressive chip when it comes to performance, and not really much to complain. A lot of its performance characteristics are pretty similar to Ryzen 7000 on the desktop, which doesn't disappoint really in many metrics at all. When it comes to cooling on this system, unfortunately, only having the CPU fan and relatively limited top ventilation means there's only so much you can do. But I'd say this cooler does about as well as I can for this limited space in here, 
but definitely can get a little bit toasty nearing in the 90s degrees with the top on. With the top off and better airflow, it's in the low 80s. So it's in spec, reasonably quiet unless I'm pushing all the cores for extended periods. It's fine, but also there's only so much you can ask for with no case fans and relatively tiny vents on this system. Overall, I think this motherboard works pretty well in this case, and it's an interesting option that has quite a bit of CPU performance and some other interesting things. And I was happy I also tried running TrueNAS just doing GPU pass-through to all the VMs. And yeah, I'm happy. Overall, as a NAS unit, um, I like trinking with things like CPU performance and stuff, and I'm happy that this motherboard gives me quite a bit of options and allows me to do that in a relatively small form factor that isn't too loud, is, I'd say, relatively pleasing to look at, and a relatively painless build. Let me know what your thoughts on this build are in the comments below, and if there's any other testing you'd like me to do with this motherboard in the future. Thanks for watching.